Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. On the day of Pentecost, there are assembled but a few. But the most important thing was soon to come then from heaven God did sin like a mighty rushing wind and they found that Holy Ghost so genuine well it's not for and it's not better salvation Skeptics all were standing by. What does this mean? They cried. Can't see the way you Pentecostals act. But Peter preached to them that day, and he hastened them to say, We want this Holy Ghost so genuine. Oh, it's not born, and it's not fashion. Salvation sent from God. If the devil has you bound, he's running you around. There's just one way that your soul can be set free. If you'll repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Ghost will come so genuine. Well, it's not for and it's not fashion. It's salvation sent from God. It's not for and it's not fashion. Well, the salvation sent from God is divine. Well, it's old and it's new, it's powerful and it's true. I'm so glad this Holy Ghost is genuine. Well, on the day of Pentecost, there were symbols but a few, but the most important thing was soon to come. Can't see the way you Pentecostals act. But Peter preached to them that day and hastened them to say, We want this Holy Ghost so genuine. Lord, it's not born.
I guess, the very other side of the world. Brother and Sister Richardson, Jerry Richardson, his good wife, have been missionaries for three terms and have been appointed for a fourth term to the mission field. They are veterans. They know what it's all about. They've carried a burden for years. Brother Richardson, of course, was uh, raised on the mission field himself some and, uh, and tasted of that even as a, in his growing up years. And God called him to continue the work, and he has done that with distinction. And so they are embarking on their fourth term as missionaries in Madagascar. And we're so happy that he could be here today and his good wife, Sister Richardson. We're glad you're here. And Sister Jerry, we're glad that you're with us also. And we, we uh, y'all need to come by often. And um, I know Brother Chris would like that. And we'd like that every time you're on, on deputation. And as long as you are and you're in, you're in the Houston area, we want you to come by. And we're glad to have Chris here. We appreciate the progress that... that, uh, <laughs> that uh, now, I don't know what all that means, Brother and Sister Richards. I... <laughs> I know his face is red. Be that as it may, it's a special blessing and an honor for TBC to have Brother and Sister Richardson and Jerry with us. Let's give them a hand and welcome them to Texas Bible. Praise the name of Jesus. So happy to be able to greet you this morning in that name that is above all others. And we know that the name of Jesus is a powerful name. I'm so happy that he can work in ways that we do not even understand from time to time. He's able to do miracles. He can kill the most powerful one. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Well, we just thought you'd like to hear how it's done on the other end of the world. We're glad to be in TBC today, worshiping the Lord with you. I like what I feel here. Yes. I feel the nearness of the presence of the Lord, and thank you for making us welcome. We are excited about what is happening in Madagascar. The clock is moving very, very rapidly, so I am going to uh, just say we're glad to be here and move on. Thank you, Brother Enzi, for allowing us to come, and let's just worship the Lord as we look at a field that is blooming with revival. Hallelujah. Some folks say we're going to have revival. Other people say there is a revival in the future, but I believe revival is here now. Yes. Hallelujah. If we are willing to do what we can do, the Lord has a revival for us now. Hallelujah. He is working and we praise him for that beautiful, miraculous power of Jesus Christ. In case you are sitting there wondering where in the world is Madagascar, the best way to describe it is go as far as you can go and you'll be awful close. It's a large island off the southeast coast of Africa. That island measures the same size as the state of Texas. So all you Texans would say that's a big place. But the Lord has given us the responsibility to evangelize 11 and a half million people. We haven't reached them all yet, but we praise the Lord for one of the greatest revivals in our world working in the country of Madagascar, and we praise him for that. Before we begin today, anything that we share with you, I want to make it very clear. All the praise, all the glory, all the honor must go to Jesus. I learned a long time ago that if we try to take the glory, we stop the flow of the Spirit. And His glory He will not give to another. Let's make sure we always give it to Him. If there's a miracle done, you didn't do it, He did it. If something happens wonderful, you didn't do it, he did it. Let's give him the praise. Let's give him the glory. Let's give him the honor. 
Haleluya. I'm very tempted to start calling names and saying we're glad to see so and so and so and so and so and so. But if I did that, then I'd get in trouble and wouldn't get through. I want my wife to come and greet you and say what she'd like. You may be seated, and I think they're going to sing. We'll just enjoy a great time today. Well, it's great to be here this morning, and uh, we've been excited about this service this morning. We've excited that anytime we have an opportunity to share what Jesus is doing, and we are in the middle of a revival in Madagascar. And there's no other place in the world that is exciting than being right in the middle of a revival. And I found out some 15 years ago now when we were going to Madagascar the first time that uh, you can be happy anywhere in the world if you know that you're in the will of the Lord. And we're real thankful that we're in Madagascar. We're able to be an instrument in a glorified mud ball for the Lord in Madagascar. Amen. It's just great to be in the will of the Lord and to be used by Him. That's great. I just love it. And uh, we're excited about what's going on. Anytime you have revival and see the move of the Lord, you have miracles. And we, we're seeing all kinds of miracles take place in, in Madagascar. I wanted to share one with you this morning. There was a young man by the name of Daniel who was brought into a Wednesday afternoon ladies' auxiliary prayer meeting. Now, Daniel had been, somebody had been witnessing to him. And they told Daniel, now, if you'll come to church and let them pray for you, the Lord will heal you. Daniel had not been able to walk nor even stand for over seven years. So as they brought him into that service and laid him down on the front row and progressed on with the service, uh, it wasn't but a few minutes and Daniel was trying to interrupt and trying to get their attention. He had something he wanted to say. Well, you know, you don't normally let a first-timer in a service just take over the service. But they let him have his voice and he says, Would it be all right if you'd pray for me now so that I can enjoy the rest of this service with you? Well, that was just Daniel's faith reaching out. He believed that the Lord was going to heal him. And as they prayed for Daniel, it was just a few minutes that he was walking back and forth in front of that congregation. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was praising the Lord for, for healing. And someone stopped him and said, you don't have to be just content with uh, healing, but God has something else for you. If you'll just believe him, he can give you the beautiful gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, Daniel had no reason to doubt they told him if he'd come and be prayed for, he'd be healed, and that worked. And now they was telling him if he'd uh, repent of his sins and praise the Lord for what he's done for him, then he'd receive the Holy Ghost. So just in lifting up his hands and worshiping the Lord, he received that glorious gift of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> they had to go out and find the pastor. He wasn't even there, but someone went out and found him. As they brought him back to, to the church, Daniel was waiting patiently but anxiously to be baptized in the beautiful name of Jesus. And it's beautiful when you see a miracle of healing, when you see blind eyes open. We've even seen those that's been raised from the dead. But there's no greater miracle than to know that the Lord can come into a heart and change it and make it brand new. And we've seen that miracle happen just last year over 3,000 times. And I praise the Lord for that. I want Jerry to come, and Chris is going to help us out this morning. Chris doesn't normally get to be a part of our team anymore. He's here trying to learn something. <laughs> Someone told me this morning that he was the biggest procrastinator here at the school, and I said, well, he's had 19 years of experience, so he's pretty good at it. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to be here today with my parents and to see Chris again, maybe. But <laughs> I've, enjoyed, I've enjoyed meeting people from... <laughs> I've enjoyed meeting some people from TBC, and I just think that the Lord has got his hand upon TBC, and I was thinking of how wonderful the Lord can be to us. Sometimes we take for granted the things that we have and the things that we get, but that's not true. If we praise him for the little things, he'll give us many things, and he gives us this because of his mercy. He is so wonderful to us. I was thinking of like when Chris had his car accident. It was just the hand of the Lord. You know, the Lord has been wonderful to our family. It was just the hand of the Lord that Chris didn't get seriously hurt or even killed. And I just praise the Lord for that. And I just was thinking, you know, here in America we say the Lord is wonderful or he is so wonderful. But if you take it from the Malagasy language, they say that the Lord has been too wonderful. And that's how I feel today. He's just been too wonderful. Good, the Lord 
our hands and praise Jesus together. We love you, Lord. We magnify you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Young man came into the church at Mandritsara, which is in the northern part of Madagascar. Very first time in service, he got a beautiful experience of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. They took him and baptized him in Jesus' name, and he was just totally saturated with the Spirit of God, drunk, just glad to be a Pentecostal. Went back to his house, burst through the doors, and said, Mom and Dad, i got to tell you what happened to me. said, I went to that Pentecostal church. said, I went to the altar, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. and said, I'm the happiest person in the world. Well, they weren't quite as thrilled about it as he was. In fact, they told him, said, Son, you know you can't go to that church. If you go there, then you won't be allowed to go to the tombs anymore and worship our ancestors. They will become angry with us. And none of our prayers will be answered. We'll have many, many problems just because of your stubbornness. So now we forbid you to ever go back to that church. I might just inject that 95% of the Malagasy people pray to dead ancestors. Anybody that's dead is an ancestor to somebody. So if you want to get promoted real quick, all you got to do is die. But <laughs> they really believe that the ancestors are not gods, but the ancestors are in the presence of God. So if you're going to pray because you're a mere human, you're not allowed to pray directly to God. You're supposed to pray to the ancestors. And if they like you, they will go talk to God for you. The real problem is they don't know who the mediator between God and man is. I'm glad I know who he is today. Hallelujah. But because of the fear and the dread that uh, ancestor worship leaves, and there's that, that uh, fear that they might displease those ancestors. In this particular case, the father knew enough about our church to know that we taught against ancestor worship. He forbid his son to ever go back to that church. The next Sunday morning, though, the boy told his mom and dad, he said, Mom and Dad, I, I've always done what you told me to. I've always tried to be a good son. 
But this is one time I've got to go against you. I have found Jesus. And he is the most important thing in my life. Hallelujah. That's quite a trial for a brand new convert. But he stood it. He went to church. When he went to church, they called a meeting of the family. And when I say family, I mean cousins, aunts, uncles, you know, way out there. Embracing everybody that's blood related. And they brought this uh, boy to the... Uh, they, as the boy was at church, they, they brought the subject of the boy to this family meeting, wondering what in the world they could do to break the hold that the Pentecostals had on him. So they made a plan. The next Sunday, when this boy went to church, they were going to send representatives of their family to the service. And when he was there, they were going to wait for that most opportune moment. And then they were going to drag him out of that service. And they figured he would be so embarrassed that he'd never go back again. Sounded like a pretty good plan. The next Sunday morning, sure enough, the boy had come a little early and he was praying in the altar. When, when uh, he got up from praying, he just sat down on the front seat and the service progressed. But somewhere his uncle and cousin had slipped into the back and they were sitting on the back row. He didn't know they were back there. And the service began. People began worshiping. You know, we Pentecostals get kind of lost in the spirit. and We don't know who's around us or really care too much sometimes. But uh, they were just having a real good time singing, praising the Lord. And uh, this uncle kept sitting there waiting. Now, you know, should I do it right now or, or wait a little later? So he kept waiting and kept waiting. And, and suddenly something began to, began to get a hold of him. He began to feel something he had never felt before in all of his life. Tears begin to flow down his face. He tried his best to stop them, but he just couldn't do it. As he sat there trying to stop the tears, one of the Pentecostals saw what was happening, and they stepped over to him. said, you know what you really need? You need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He began to describe to him what it was and what it would do and how it would work. And so Uncle finally saw this. This was a losing battle. He was just crying too hard now. So he did what they said. He lifted his hands. He began to magnify the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In just a little while, he was speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. Hallelujah. His son, who was sitting beside him, saw what was happening to his dad, and he said, well, I might as well get it too. So he got the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. They were baptized in Jesus' name that day, and then they had to go back and report to dad. Well, I said, did you go to the service? Yes, we went. Did you sit in the back, you know, like we talked about? Sure did. Did everything just according to plan. Well, did you drag him out? Well, there was a little deviation of plan right there. You see, while we were sitting there, something began to move within us. And we got the Holy Ghost too. We found out what your son said is real. It is true. It is alive. It does work. Hallelujah. 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 My, it's exciting to know the power of Jesus. He's not sending you out into this world to do his work without empowering you with something that will keep you. Hallelujah. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Hallelujah. If we had a lot of time, I'd share a whole lot of miracles with you because I like to share them. But I don't have time today for that. What I would like to do is... Um, present a copy of Madagascar's miracle story to Brother Enzi that he might put it in the school library. And uh, if you want a copy for yourself, we do have some copies. They're six ninety five each. This was written by my mother. Now, my mother and father were the founding missionaries in Madagascar. They retired in 1981 and then came back to the field for a visit in 1988. And while they were there, we together wrote this book. It's packed full of miracles. It'll build your faith. If you'd like to have a copy, that's fine. I'd be glad for you to get one. But we would like to have a copy, Brother Enzi, if that's possible, in the school library so that uh, those that maybe don't have access to buying a copy can at least read it. So uh, this is for the school. May God bless you. My wife gave me orders that I am to start the film at 10 minutes till. I didn't make it. I'm in trouble. So since I'm in trouble anyway, 
I'd like to share one other thing with you. <laughs> oh, praise God. I thought you'd like to hear about our Bible school in Madagascar. We, we have a Bible school training program for ministers. We call it a ministerial training program because all we are interested in is training pastors. And uh, what I have found that's very, very beautiful is the results of this training program. Of all of the graduates that have graduated from that school, approximately 80% are still involved in the ministry. And uh, that's, that's a good percentage. We, we thank the Lord for that. Also, just uh, a couple of years ago, we started a pilot program that's working quite well. We have a two-year program, and the only reason we have two instead of three is that's all we can afford. But we have a two-year program, and we have made our second year a floating school. In other words, it doesn't stay at our campus. The second year moves into an area where there is a city and a lot of potential areas to work out from and start new churches. Then on the weekends, during the uh, school term of the second year, our Bible school students go out in teams. They'll go out evangelizing, uh, knocking on doors, having services in the marketplace, doing all the things that they can do to start a new church in a community. The year before last, we started at least eight churches that are still in existence from that second year Bible school class. This last year, there were over 10 started. And uh, what is so exciting is many times when those students leave Bible school, there's already a self-supporting church waiting for them as a result of their work. And uh, I just thought you'd like to, to hear that report because I believe that Bible school is very, very important. I believe that training yourself to do the work of God in whatever level it is can be the, the best and the most valuable part of your life. And the more training and the more you absorb now, the less you're going to have to dig later, even though life is always going to be full of digs. <laughs> Praise God. But I believe that you can get a lot of things at Texas Bible College that will help you on the mission field when the Lord calls you there. Notice I didn't say if he does. I said when he does. Praise God. I'm convinced there are some people sitting here today that if the Lord tears his coming, you will end up on the mission field. And I'm in the recruiting business today. Madagascar needs missionaries. As you look at the film, I know that you're, you're going to be excited. First of all, you'll see a little bit about the country. But then you're going to see the work. You're going to see some of our churches. You will see some of our worship. And uh, if you want to hit the aisles, well, I'll be right behind you. We'll have a great time worshiping the Lord together. Let's lift up our eyes and look on the field of Madagascar. Madagascar, the fourth largest island in the world, is situated off the southeast coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. The best way to describe its location is to leave here and go as far as you can go and you'll be awfully close. The island of Madagascar is 1,000 miles long, 350 miles wide, approximately the size of the state of Texas. 
It has a population of 11 and a half million people that God has given us the responsibility to evangelize. Living in the highlands on a tropical island, we have the best of two worlds. We have roses and other beautiful flowers, fruits, and vegetables 12 months of the year. We have beautiful climate, never too cold, never too hot. But at any time of the year, when you leave the highlands and go to the coastal regions, it is extremely hot. The country is probably about 50 to 70 years behind America. It is common to see ox carts of yesteryear and modern day automobiles competing for the road. The capital city, Antananarivo, with a population of one and a half million people, is where we live. Narrow streets, crowded conditions, and many long traffic jams are unenjoyable, but we love living there because of the work of God. Like any third world country, the marketing is usually an open market. You have to bargain for everything you buy. The bargaining takes a long time, and you're often hampered by beggars on the street. We are so appreciative of the Ladies Auxiliary Mothers Memorial Program, which provides appliances for the missionaries. This is a scene from the local laundromat. I'm so thankful that I don't have to do my laundry here, but we have been provided with a refrigerator, range, washer, and dryer. Thank you, ladies, for caring. It's always a problem. We live behind high walls and have metal bars on all the windows and doors. Plus, we have four great big German Shepherd police dogs. Here, Duke, the largest of the four, is carrying a brick in his mouth. He normally carries a large piece of firewood. And when people pass by the gate and look in, they immediately get a mental picture. If I go in there, that is my leg he will be carrying around. Thanks to Duke, we have no people wandering in our yard. The homes on the high plateau are usually made of mud bricks. The roofs can be made with glass, clay tiles, or sheets of metal. Many of the older houses were built without cement. The bricks will be stacked two or three stories high using only mud for mortar, and yet it will stand for many years. The houses in the coastal lowlands are normally made of bamboo, straw, or metal sheets. Rice is the main crop and the main food of the Malagasy people. They will eat rice three times a day if at all possible. Rice for breakfast, rice for lunch, and rice for supper. Now I like rice, but not three times a day. Madagascar has more cattle than people. Cattle being so plentiful makes the price of beef affordable. So we have plenty of beef to eat. Chickens are quite expensive. They are normally four or five dollars still running. But by the time you take the feathers off, you're left with just a bag of bones. There are also ducks, geese, turkeys, and pigs, but we mostly eat beef, beef, and more beef. The central focal point of all Malagasy culture is the tomb. The dead have a very important place in the eyes of the living. Malagasy's believe there is only one supreme being, but they do not know that they can go directly to him. They feel they must pray to the dead, who in turn take their needs to the Supreme One. Their real problem is they do not know who the mediator between God and man is. Who he is? What is his name? His name is Jesus. A part of the ancestral worship is the famadiana, or the turning of the dead. The family will gather at the tomb, open the tomb, and bring out the bodies of the dead, wrapping them in new cloths. They will dance with the bodies above their heads, and each member of the family will participate, hoping that the ancestors will smile upon them so that they can receive answers to their prayers. This idolatry has continued for many years. We are the only church in Madagascar that preaches it is wrong to pray to the dead. We are the only church that has seen people truly delivered from the hold that the dead have on the living. The church in Madagascar was started in 1970 by my father, missionary Denzel Richardson. In 1974, we were appointed to join them there, but because of revolution in the country, it was March 1976 before we finally arrived. At that time, there were six churches and nine national ministers. In 1981, Brother Richardson Sr. felt it was the will of God for him to retire. It was then that I was made the superintendent of the work. Praise the Lord for revival. We now have over 200 national preachers and over 200 churches and preaching places. I believe that the most important ingredient to continuing revival is involvement of national preachers. They too must have a burden and desire to reach their own people. They can go where we can never go. We have churches that are three days walk from the nearest road. I will probably never visit them, but praise the Lord, there is someone declaring the gospel in the interior. 
I appreciate all of our national preachers. Most of our churches are crowded, and usually the children have to sit on the floor. Revival brings growth, and growth has its problems, but thank the Lord for this kind of problem. The church at Mandruta is an exciting place. The moment I drive into the edge of the town, people begin to run to try to beat me to the middle of town. They will be screaming at the top of their lungs, Missionaire! Missionaire! You see, there are two churches in this little town. The Catholic Church has six members. Everyone else attends the Pentecostal Church. I believe that everybody ought to be Pentecostal. The mayor ought to be Pentecostal. The chief of police ought to be Pentecostal. We praise the Lord for revival in Mandruta. The building is too small now, and everybody can't get inside for the services, but they can all rejoice that they have found the light. The beginning of the church at Ambuvuri has quite an unusual story. Seven or eight members were meeting in a small room of a house. It seemed like they were destined to have seven or eight until Jesus comes. They had tried their best, knocking on doors, passing out tracts, witnessing in the market, fasting and praying, but nothing produced results. One day, one of the members came back from visitation with a good report. He said, I have someone who will be attending service on Sunday morning. He did not give them the details, and it's a good thing he didn't. On Sunday morning when he arrived with his visitor, it was the village idiot, a person half-dressed, totally insane because of demon possessions, but at least he had kept his word and had come. They had seated him near the front and proceeded with the service. During the worship, the demons were made uncomfortable with the praise to Jesus. They refused to be quiet any longer. The members brought this demon-possessed man to the front and began to cast out the demons in Jesus' name. In about ten minutes, that young man was speaking in tongues as the Spirit of God gave him the utterance. He was baptized in Jesus' name. One hour later, you would never have known that this was the same man. As outreach plans were made for the following week, the new convert said, I know where I can reach one. Of course, he's just like I was, but if the Lord can do it for me, he can do it for him too. I praise the Lord that if Jesus could reach to where we were, he can reach anybody. The following Sunday morning, sure enough, village idiot number two was in service. Several others had heard what had happened and had come also. After just a few minutes of praise and worship, the demons began to disrupt. This second young man was brought to the front and was prayed for. He too was totally delivered. He received the Holy Ghost that morning. Revival has come to this town, and now there are many members. What is so amazing is that the people of the community seem to forget the name of the church. They cannot remember the name United Pentecostal Church or Fiangunana Panticotista Mitramatra, but they do remember, you know, the church where the demons get cast out, the church where healings and miracles take place. Praise God that we can be known not just by a denominational title, but as the people who have the power of the name of Jesus. Madagascar are being built as testimonies of the power of Jesus. This particular church is in Sirumandidi. For $1,000 help from America, this church was constructed. I don't know if there are people here tonight that the Lord would be able to bless you and you could give $1,000 to help build a church. Some churches need 2,000, but praise the Lord for every contribution that is making this gospel to be preached. They have very simple buildings, no electricity, no fancy musical instruments, no carpet on the floors, but there is the dynamic power of Jesus Christ working in every service. I praise the Lord for revival. The church at Ambudai, a great church, a great group of people, for $2,000 this building was built. Who knows but what somehow by working together, you extending your arm to work with the Malagasy Church, we could build a church in uh, a testimony that you have also found the joy and the peace of God and you want to let your light shine that others may see him and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You can notice the joy and the peace as these people worship and praise the Lord, all because somebody unselfishly gave $2,000 to help build a building. 
Now they need to tear the walls out and go bigger, but praise the Lord for growing problems. I show you this church because it's in the coastal region. Very, very hot. As you look at these people and see the joy on their face, you see them singing in their choir. Little would you realize that these people live in homes about like this. They don't have anything of this world's goods to boast about, but they do have a Savior that is alive. They have found the greatest ingredient of life. Material possessions do not bring peace and joy, but the Spirit of God living and dwelling within us does bring that peace to us.